guest host for Point of View. Welcome to Point of View. This is Merrill Matthews with the Institute for Policy Innovation sitting in for Kirby Anderson today. And you are going to be excited about the program. Clear your schedule for the next two hours because we are going to be talking to two of the country's best experts on intelligent design. In studio with me is Charles Stoffis. He is executive, one of the executive pastors at Denton Bible Church in Denton, Texas. Uh, he also is, uh, uh, he serves as director of their theological institute and he is coordinating and teaching the Denton Bible Church Young Guns program that uh, is a great program for young men uh, learning, uh, working to know more about the Bible and perhaps go in the ministry. So Charles is with us, and I'm going to turn it over to Charles to uh, introduce our first guest, Dr. Michael Behe. Buddy, this is a real exciting privilege for me uh, to uh, just to spend some time with uh, Dr. Behe. Dr. Michael Behe has actually been at Denton Bible a couple of times, mm-hmm. and so just the kindest man that you will ever meet, and yet a brilliant scientist also. He was uh, educated at Drexel University in Philadelphia with his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry, and then he went on to get his Ph.D. at the University of Pennsylvania, and his focus there was on sickle cell disease. He then did some postdoctoral work at the National Institute of Health and uh, and Queens College. He did some work there. He's the author of several very very important books to the intelligent design movement. Uh, first, uh, with Darwin's Black Box that he published back in 1996, and then several other very influential books uh, in 2007, The Edge of Evolution, and then also I think this year it was Darwin Devolves. And we're going to ask Dr. Behe about each of those in turn. But boy, it's it's really uh, a, a privilege to have him here with us uh, today. Dr. Behe, it sounds like you're a serious scientist. <laughs> well, uh, opinions differ on that, uh, <laughs> but I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Behe, it's, it's such a great uh, privilege to be with you again. I know we uh, met each other just several years ago uh, briefly and just ha- got to spend a little bit of time there at Denton Bible Church. I know that me personally, that I've greatly benefited from your works. I know that uh, I'd love to hear your your, your uh, brief overview of how you got introduced into intelligent design. I remember hearing you from uh, many years ago talk about three very influential books, at least two of them. One was The Mystery of Life's origin by uh, Charles Thaxton and Walter Bradley and Roger Olson that really addressed the issue of chemical evolution. But maybe more significantly, it was a book by Michael Denton entitled Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. And I know you had mentioned, if I remember correctly, you had mentioned that that was a pretty significant book in your kind of uh, travels uh, into this area of intelligent design. Could you share with our audience a little bit about your, your path to intelligent design theory? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, I were, I'm a Roman Catholic, and I was born and raised in a Catholic family. I went to parochial schools, but uh, evolution was never a concern in our, uh, in our church. And I was taught in parochial school, in grade school, high school, that um, if God wanted to make life through natural laws, you know, who were we to tell him what to do? And uh, it seemed that uh, the best explanation so far was uh, Darwin's theory that uh, life could arise through random changes and selection. Hey, that was okay with me. Uh, you know, I I didn't have any particular uh, uh, argument against it. Uh, and uh, my teachers continued to tell me that through college and graduate school and, and so on. Uh, and But in the middle 1980s, when I was a, an associate professor at Lehigh University, I read a book uh, by Michael Denton called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis. And, and uh, Denton, at the time, was a, an agnostic, and he didn't really have any axe to grind. And he uh, pointed to all sorts of problems that Darwin's theory had. And, and it really shocked me because I had never thought – much about uh, Darwin's theory or evolution. My research was on other stuff. And uh, frankly, it made me mad because I had been led to believe that this was overwhelmingly supported. And so I went to the science library and and, um, in biochemistry, you study systems that are, you know, phenomenally complex and really elegant. And I remember before reading Netton's book, I would kind of ask myself, gee, I, I wonder how such a thing as this c- 
could evolve and then shrug my shoulders and say, well, I guess somebody knows, and then go on to other things. But after reading his book, I, I wanted to know who had explained uh, uh, many of the complex systems I, I had uh, learned about. And, uh, it turns out nobody had. Uh, when you look for the scientific papers in the science journals where real science would be published, uh, there was a complete silence on it. And again, I was very upset because I thought I was being led to uh, believe something that was not uh, true. And from then on, I, I had not uh, been uh, concerned with evolution, but then on I, I became very interested in it. And uh, pretty soon, you, if you have any reason to doubt Darwin's theory, you uh, intelligent design pretty quickly uh, suggests itself because uh, the way that the, the foundation of life is, is just so elegant that uh, we recognize that as, as the work of, of a mind. And um, I didn't do anything for a while, but then I, I met a man named Philip Johnson, who mm -hmm. was a a professor of law at UC Berkeley, and he had written a book called Darwin on Trial, which I uh, was another great book uh, that I read, and and he kind of plugged me into his growing network of of folks who were questioning Darwin's theory and supporting design, and and uh, from that I got the idea that I could write uh, my own book. Hey, if if these folks could do it, maybe I could too. You know, scientists don't usually write books. But I did, and that became uh, Darwin's Black Box. And I was hoping that, you know, maybe uh, a few people in the field would read it so that real see what the arguments are, and maybe some of my relatives too. But it turns out that it, it uh, caught the attention of the press and, and got a lot of publicity. So it kind of... Uh, move the argument into the public sphere, too. And so since then, the past 20 years or so, I've been uh, devoting my major efforts to questions about evolution and design. Our guest for this hour is Dr. Michael Behe. He is a professor at Lehigh University, and uh, he is also with the Discovery Institute, a prolific author who's written a number of books and uh, is one of the country's leading experts on the issue of intelligent design. We're going to open up the phones a little later to take your calls. When we come back, we'll talk more with Dr. Michael Behe. And if you want to know more about him, go to pointofview.net. We have information up there with his uh, bio and uh, picture and I, I believe we have an article up there by him so if you want to find out more about him just go to pointofview.net and that'll take you to the discovery institute and uh, provide you with some information about that so stay with us we're going to come back in a minute and we want to find out what dr b he thinks are some of those problems with darwin's design that he had, he mentioned stay with us we'll be back in just a minute You're listening to Point of View, your listener-supported source for truth. And welcome back to Point of View. Merrill Matthews sitting in for Kirby Anderson today. In studio with me is Charles Stoffis, uh, one of the executive pastors at Denton Bible Church. And on the line, Dr. Michael Behe of Lehigh University and also a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. And we are talking about intelligent design. Dr. Behe, uh, before the break, you talked about your very first book that you wrote back in 1996, uh, Darwin's Black Box. And I know that in that you uh, discuss the biochemical challenge to evolution. And you, you identify in that several examples in the inner workings of a, of a simple cell, which is not simple at all, but a simple cell where you have this biochemical machinery that just is extraordinarily complex. And then you also you talk about something called irreducible complexity. Uh, I, I would like for you to just really explain to our, our listeners what that is, irreducible complexity. And then you use uh, the illustration of a mousetrap to kind of get uh, help us understand that. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, in, in his book, The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin uh, said that his idea of random changes and natural selection 
uh, had to work by, quote, numerous successive slight modifications, tiny steps over a long period of time, because he knew if things improved too quickly or in big jumps, then it would look suspiciously as if something other than chance were involved. Um, but uh, so you can ask yourself, what, what sort of a system would be very hard to make in small steps if it had to be helpful and functional each step of the way as or otherwise natural selection wouldn't work on it. And in Darwin's Black Box, I wrote that one such uh, system is what I called irreducibly complex, which just means that you have a machine or some, some, some system which has a number of parts, and it's only when the parts come together and interact with each other that they can work. And uh, as you said, uh, uh, an example of this from our everyday life is a mousetrap, a mechanical mousetrap that you can get at the store. It's got a spring. It's got a metal hammer that hits the mouse, and it's got a platform and a number of other pieces. And it turns out that all those pieces are needed for it to work. And if you're missing one, then the mousetrap is broken. So the question is, if you wanted to evolve something like a mousetrap by something like Darwin's idea of random changes and improving the machine at each step of the way, you quickly find it's really difficult, even for something as simple as that. Well, the machinery of the cell is much, much more complicated than a simple mousetrap. And I pointed to a, a couple of examples uh, in Darwin's Black Box of uh, uh, irreducibly complex systems, that is, biochemical systems, molecular systems at the very foundation of life that Darwin didn't know about. And uh, one good example is something called the bacterial flagellum, which is quite literally an outboard motor that uh, bacteria can use to swim. And just like a, an outboard motor in our, our, our uh, normal world, it's got a propeller and a motor, and it's got clamps to hold it onto the side of the cell, just like there are clamps to hold the outboard motor onto a boat and many other pieces, too. And again, if you're missing one of these, uh, it's broken. So the question is, how could you make something like that step by tiny step? And it's a huge problem for Darwin. And it turns out that if you look in the science library, if you look for papers that might try to explain this in real scientific detail, you don't find a single one. And as a matter of fact, in the 25 or so years since I wrote about that, there still hasn't been any scientific paper trying to explain how Darwin's mechanism could uh, handle something like that. If you'd like to talk to Dr. Michael Behe, I'm going to open up the lines at the end of the hour, bottom of the hour, 1-800-351-1212, 1-800-351-1212. If you have a question or a comment for Dr. Michael Behe, we'll be taking those calls uh, at the bottom of the hour. Uh, Dr. Behe, the, uh, are, are there other key aspects of Darwin's arguments that we look back on and say now, it, 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 even perhaps those who are following in sort of the evolutionary model that we just know that this wasn't right. Darwin said this or that or the other, and those those are just no longer tenable positions. Uh, well, uh, sure. The, the, the major problem, I think, with Darwin is that when he wrote in uh, the mid-1800s, uh, so little comparatively was known about life. Cells were thought to be little globs of protoplasm, you know, pretty simple things, and uh, people didn't know about molecules, what molecules were. They weren't sure they existed. So all of the, uh, all of the uh, advances that modern science has made in biology, uh, the discovery of DNA and the genetic code and molecular machines and regulation and, and uh, so much more, uh, were completely unknown to him. So uh, he didn't know about the very foundation of life, and it turns out that when you try to apply his theory there, it quickly uh, 
you know, runs into forbidding problems. And the main problem with Darwin's theory is that yes, it can it can uh, it can uh, favor uh, a change, a mutation that helps an organism a little bit, but it can't see beyond that. And so, if one change would help a little bit, but it doesn't, it precludes further changes, or it blocks a route to something better. Natural selection doesn't know anything about that. It doesn't care. And so it will go into blind alleys, you know, way more often than otherwise. And even worse is that sometimes it's helpful for a cell to lose information, to lose uh, a gene or a, a feature. And, and uh, if it's helpful to lose that, then natural selection will actually favor devolution, the simplification and uh, degradation of, a, uh, of a, an organism. So some of those things Darwin didn't know about, and, uh, and they're really big, big problems for, for his theory. And, uh, but the scientific community as a whole generally doesn't, doesn't pay attention to that because they, they don't have an acceptable answer uh, to take its place. 1-800-351-1212 if you'd like to talk to Dr. Michael Behe or have a question for him. Charles? Dr. Behe, um, as I understand it, uh, uh, Charles Darwin was proposing natural selection as a mechanism that would serve as a kind of designer substitute. And yet, uh, as you have just indicated, uh, natural selection, uh, evolution is by definition an undirected, unguided cause. And so if we're trying to realize something as complex as you're describing, how in the world do you get there without having an end in mind? I mean, in other words, evolution is undirected, going nowhere in particular. It's blind. How do you get to that extraordinarily complex end without the ability to kind of implement some kind of a plan? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and in short, uh, you can't, but, <laughs> but uh, it's not polite to say so in scientific company these days. Uh, yeah, if you have a mousetrap, you know, just think of a mousetrap, and, and, and if mousetrap can't be explained, what else could? Well, suppose that, you know, uh, there was a hole in the ground, and maybe that could trap a mouse if it was deep enough, and... Um, and um, yeah, the mouse couldn't scramble out, and it, if it ran over the hole, it would fall in. Well, okay, great. Yeah, so that's a mouse trap. Okay, how are you going to get? What's the what's the next step? Well, make it bigger, so so that in case the mouse runs across a wider area, it might be able to fall in. And how about after that? Well, I don't know. Maybe you could put some brambles at the bottom, so it might. Uh, might injure the mouse when it when it fell, but there's no way that it's going to get to a complex system like a mechanical mouse trap, and uh, and this plagues all of uh, all of life. You know, it, Darwin's theory is great for one tiny change, but it's uh, terrible at explaining cooperative features. If you have some system that, again, needs a couple of things in order to work or to do some, uh, some uh, function in particular, then Darwin's theory rapidly breaks down. Do it's great for one step, but not for multiple steps. Dr. Behe, hold that thought for a second. We'll come back in just a minute on Point of View. You are listening to Point of View. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. And now, here again, your guest host for Point of View. And welcome back. Merrill Matthews sitting in for Kirby Anderson today. And we are talking about intelligent design with Dr. Michael Behe of Lehigh University. He's also a senior fellow uh, with the Discovery Institute. And it is, uh, do you, Dr. Behe, do you see uh, intelligent design being more widely embraced? Is it, is it something that's gaining some steam out there? 
Well, I, I, I think it is in uh, just in uh, kind of um, a little bit changes in attitude, some in the scientific community and uh, some in the popular culture. It's just thought about more and seems to be referred to more. And uh, even if one kind of is defending Darwin's theory or uh, or something else, then nonetheless, it, it's more often a topic of conversation, even though official science bodies and a, a lot of people, you know, really dislike it <laughs> to uh, to uh, be mild about it. it nonetheless, it, it's there, and, and it's gaining momentum simply because of uh, the progress of science. The more and more we know about science, the more and more uh, elegant and complex and, and sophisticated we find that life is. 1-800-351-1212 if you'd like to talk to Dr. Michael Behe or you have a question for him and in studio with me is Charles Stoffus, one of the executive pastors at Denton Bible Church. Dr. Behe, uh, we speak of design and, and what in my reading on this subject, it seems uncontroversial that, that, that there is in fact the appearance of design at the very least. In fact, it was Richard Dawkins in The Blind Watchmaker who said that biology is the study of complicated things that have the appearance Appearance have having been designed for a purpose. I mean, can you comment a little bit more about this on the issue of the appearance of design versus actual design? And in fact, how long do we have to wait for some kind of an example of where actual design can be explained apart from an appeal to intelligence? Uh, well, yeah, okay, that that's true. It, um, everybody, everybody in the world agrees that life has many, many features that uh, appear at the very least to be designed, even, as you say, Richard Dawkins, who is an arch-Darwinist and uh, defender of Darwin's theory, says that biology is the study of things that appear to be designed. That's the very definition that he gives for biology. Uh, what they mean, though, is that they uh, – that since Darwin and since Darwin's idea about selection and stuff, they ascribe all sorts of phenomenal things to Darwin's theory, and yet nobody has ever been able to show that, in fact, it works as advertised. And But now that science has progressed to uh, the molecular level and able to look at mutations as they occur, uh, we see that, in fact, Darwin's mechanism can do very little. I don't have uh, time to go into it in any detail, but the short answer is that um, we think that things are designed, uh, we suspect design or we conclude design when we see different parts arranged in a relationship so that they can do something, uh, they have some purpose or some function. Just think of the mouse trap. You know, if you saw those parts, you immediately recognize that they were matched to each other so that they can do this particular functioning. Well, life is just, you know, swimming in such arrangements. And uh, the, uh, despite uh, Darwinian claims, uh, it's the things that random changes, and even with selection, can really account for or have been actually shown to be accounted for uh, by natural selection uh, are very few and, and very small. It's only imagination that attributes uh, something other than real design to uh, the complex functional systems of life. 1-800-351-1212 if you have a comment or a question for uh, Dr. Michael Behe. Dr. Mike uh, Behe, if, if, if I am an intelligent design person, if I have a Ph.D. and I've just gotten my Ph.D. and I want to go out and get a job at a secular university, will they hire me? Uh, only if you've never said anything in public about, <laughs> about intelligent design. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, if you're a brilliant, uh, brilliant up-and-coming scientist, just got your Ph.D., did a postdoc, and somewhere there is a, you know, a tweet or uh, an Internet comment that you, that you think, well, hey, 
you know, there may be something to this intelligent de design stuff, uh, it, then your career is actually in, in jeopardy mm -hmm. uh, because there are people who, who seem to make it a full-time job to scan the Internet looking for stuff, and, and they will email the chairman of the department in which you're uh, working or applying to or, or some such thing in hopes of, you know, canceling you, essentially, in, in the jargon of today. So, yeah, it's so controversial that uh, there are so much, there's enough scientists, uh, not everybody, of course, but not, and there's enough scientists who hate it uh, with such a passion that they will make a, a big noise if uh, somebody known to be sympathetic to ID is applying to their department or uh, any place where they have some measure of uh, control or say over their their position. Doctor, we have a caller on the line, so let's go to that. We'll go to Jeannie in Georgia. Jeannie, you're on the air. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Behe, for standing firm and i appreciate your position i was wondering okay, how thank you how um a scientist that are rational scientists how they coincide and answer the question of the second law of thermodynamics as opposed to mm. evolution we haven't even mentioned the second law of thermodynamics yet yeah well uh people wave their hands and even really smart scientists believe what they want to believe. And they convince themselves that they're being rational uh, simply by saying these are the basic assumptions of rationality. We have to assume, they say to themselves, that there is no intelligence that can account for the universe or life or something. So therefore, something like Darwin's theory simply has to be true. And we have to just keep on plugging until we find out uh, that it is. And yeah, it, it does not match well with the second law, <laughs> law of thermodynamics, to say the least, which says that the universe uh, is always increasing in disorder. And they have a comeback or two where they say, well, yeah, but, you know, local areas of the universe can, uh, can gain in order. And that must have been what happens in life. But uh, those arguments get involved, but it's it's really uh, not very credible if you don't already have that conclusion in mind. Uh, it, it's not uh, it's not persuasive. It certainly hasn't been demonstrated, and uh, so it, it's it's funny. It's just that evolution, and intelligent design have such philosophical and even theological implications that the normal rules of reasoning don't apply. Thank you, Jeannie. Charles? Yes, uh, on this issue of uh, the objectivity of scientists, I think it was one famous uh, evolutionary scientist that said, that, in short, we can't let a divine foot in the door. In other words, we can't acknowledge any role at all for some kind of a designing intelligence. Can you speak to that? I mean, it seems like science has been completely redefined as, as not merely the search for the best explanation, but the, the best materialist explanation. Yeah, that that's correct. I, I've forgotten who it was. I think it was the uh, that, the linguist uh, Norman uh, or somebody or other on the occasion of Carl Sagan's death. He wrote an obituary and essay in the New York Times, and he said that we, meaning we scientists, we secularists, we take the side of science despite its being, you know, crazy at some times. To, despite its, its uh, silly ideas uh, in many instances, because we can't let a divine foot in the door, which was an interesting phrase. So many people, oddly enough, are terrified <laughs> or uh, <laughs> yeah, really terrified uh, that uh, God will be uh, discussed or recognized somehow in academia. And they want, uh, I assume, they want their philosophy to be the official public uh, uh, philosophy uh, for intellectuals. And uh, if they concede that 
things like Darwin's theory oh, can't do. Dr. Behe, hold that thought. We've got to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute. Now, back to Point of View, your listener-supported source for truth. And we're back. Meryl Matthew sitting in for Kirby Anderson and our guest this hour, Dr. Michael Behe. Um, we're, we've got one final segment with him, but we're not through because at the top of the hour, Dr. Brian Miller, uh, one of uh, Dr. Behe's colleagues at the Discovery Institute, will be joining us. So we'll have another whole hour to discuss the issue of intelligent design. If you want to talk to Dr. Michael Behe, we've got a little bit of time. Time left, 1-800-351-1212. Dr. Behe, you've mentioned your first book, Darwin's Black Box, uh, written uh, back in 1996. And since then, you've uh, published a number of other books. Uh, I, I would like for you to maybe explain some of those books uh, to our audience. Uh, in 2007, I think it was The Edge of Evolution, The Search for the Limits of Darwinism. What are you um, um, targeting there? Well, uh, if you're an intelligent design guy like me, then you think that some things, like the molecular machinery of the cell, are beyond Darwinian evolution. Uh, it can't account for those. But that doesn't mean that Darwinian processes, random changes and selection, don't occur. So, hey, where's the rough dividing line between things that needed purposeful, intelligent involvement and things that might just be ascribed to the workings of accident and the laws of nature. And in that book, The Edge of Evolution, I, I use the example of uh, the development of resistance by malaria to uh, the drug chloroquine, which has been in the news for other reasons <laughs> yes, it has. In, in the past. <laughs> but uh, essentially, I showed that in, a, in, a, in a, an astronomical number of chances, the malaria parasite only was able to change a tiny bit of its machinery so as to exclude chloroquine and, and survive in the presence of the drug. So I argue that the edge of evolution, what Darwin's theory can account for, is, is really much, much, much lower than even I had thought when I wrote uh, Darwin's Black Box. One of your more recent books uh, was Darwin Devolves. Was that published this year? Uh, last year. Last year. Can you explain 2019. that? 2019. Sure. Uh, Darwin Devolves. Well, uh, Darwin didn't know about DNA or molecules, or uh, but that's what mutations are. Mutations are changes in DNA, which codes for the machinery of the cell. If the coding gets changed, then a different kind of machinery is produced or can be produced or changes to it. Well, it turns out that uh, scientists these days have been able to follow the changes, uh, the mutations that help organisms, especially bacteria and viruses and so on. And the long and the short is that many of the mutations that benefit uh, bacteria or other organisms uh, that are helpful turn out to be ones that break genes, that degrade genes. They're not building anything new. They are destroying what was already there. And if you think about it for just a minute, you realize that, well, duh, you know, the genome is full of all sorts of elegant machinery. Random changes will much more often break something than improve something. But it turns out that sometimes removing something or breaking something can help. And an analogy I use is, you know, suppose your car and, you know, you would die if your car did not get better gas mileage. What's the fastest way to alter it so that it does? Well, you could take off the doors or take off the hood or get rid of excess weight. And those would be helpful. And, it, you know, it's better to remove those than to die. But that's not building anything. It's, it's breaking stuff. And so it turns out that organisms, and not just bacteria, but polar bears and dogs and, and everything that's been examined so far, 
the uh, mut helpful mutations have turned out to be uh, degradative mutations. Dr. Behe, uh, I just realized that you have something in common with President Trump. Uh, you've been attacked by oh. many, many critics. <laughs> um, and yet many of these critics, as, as I've read some of the, uh, the, uh, the criticisms, that they claim that you haven't had any kind of a response back to that. I understand, I understand that your most recent book that's not published yet is actually a collection of your responses to the multiple criticisms that you've experienced throughout your career as a uh, proponent of intelligent design. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I, I got in this, this racket uh, back in you know, the mid-1990s, and, and uh, as you might expect, lots of scientists have raised criticisms. Well, I responded to the criticisms. Criticisms and for the most part, they are uh, not well uh, not well taken. And um, but nonetheless, it seems that people rely on newspapers for their information about uh, things such as this. And and when intelligent design comes up as a, in conversation, oftentimes people, including smart people and scientists and and academics. Uh, raised the same objections that I answered back in the late 90s or early 2000s. And so Discovery Institute uh, was kind enough to uh, say, hey, why don't we gather all your responses together in one book and publish it so there will be a common place you can just point to and people can uh, go to when their friend or relative or somebody raises an objection and see that it's been answered uh, already. And that, that's going to be called A Mouse Trap for Darwin. Uh, <laughs> cute little title there. Right? And it should be out in a month or two. Good. Uh, Dr. Behe, we've got a question from Pete in Texas. Pete, we don't have a lot of time, but go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, could you explain that? I heard a, a, a professor say in the university, he didn't believe that God created, but he believed that aliens came and deposited a seed of human mankind. <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. uh, there were those that say that uh, evolution is like a faith base. Uh, would you explain that kind of? Is evolution sure. a faith based uh, a notion, Dr. <sighs> Behe? Well, it, it has become one. Uh, in Darwin's day, you could say, well, it, it wasn't then. It was a new theory, and it, it was interesting, and, you know, uh, it should be investigated. But these days, people hold to it, even with the most uh, elegant machinery that, that has been discovered in the cell, even uh, when it's been shown mostly to break things and degrade things, uh, in spite of the... You know, hold to these things in spite of the evidence, because they won't accept uh, what the evidence is pointing to. So, yeah, I'm afraid I, I do think that evolution is a faith-based theory. So they're people of faith. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah, impressive faith, too, in, in view of uh, what we have discovered. <laughs> Well, our guest this hour has been Dr. Michael Behe. Uh, he is with a, a professor at Lehigh University and a senior fellow with the Discovery Institute. And we have more information about him at our website at uh, uh, pointofview.net. So you can go there to find out more about him. And uh, Dr. Behe, you've got a new, this new book that Charles mentioned coming out. Yeah, A Mouse Trap for Darwin, it's called. And it's a collection of the responses and essays I've I've written over the past couple decades two objections to intelligent design. And when can we expect that out? That should be out sometime in November, so it will make a great Christmas gift. It's great. It sounds like a good Christmas <laughs> gift. That was a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And